Therefore, one does not incline nor engage one's mind in any way. When one does not engage, incline, nor forces one's mind, then uninclined and disengaged, even those finest perceptions fade away. And gross perceptions are not seen to arise. One enters cessation. This is how Potapada, the complete release from perceptual awareness, is understood and experienced gradually, step by step. Everybody happy? Yes? Lots of cushy? Ah, very good, very good. Starting. <laughs> Usually this is the time of the retreat when energy starts to pick up. People get quite happy now. The sequence starts to work quite a bit. Um, and now we have many things happening. This meditation, as I was explaining earlier, is very dynamic. And there is a roadmap. Oh. <laughs> there is a roadmap to this path basically, because now you're probably wondering, okay, this is really nice, but where is this going? And what are we doing here? <laughs> and this is normal because there are many things that arise in the practice, many perceptions that arise, many perceptions that fade away. And it's a really important things to know uh, which are the things that we should be expecting to happen and the perception that should be arising and the perceptions that we should be also letting go, not holding to specific stages that we've attained. And so in this meditation, a lot of the time we can kind of experience a state and be really happy in that state. and. Unless we understand how to go beyond this state, we might get stuck for a little bit in, the, in that place. So tonight I will be offering a very special sutta. It is a sutta that is very close to my heart. Uh, it is called the Put. <laughs> the Potapada Sutta, Diga Nikaya number nine. This is the first Sutta, basically when I uh, encountered the Sutta Pitaka, the, the words of the Buddha, um, I got in touch with the Dhammapada, and by the way, I've been really enjoying reading all the gathas everywhere around. The Dhammapada uh, has been what made me go forth uh, at the very beginning. So when I read these gathas all over the place, I'm just like really motivated. <laughs> it just strikes this uh, very deep chord within me. Um, and after reading the Dhammapada, which I was very impressed with, uh, I basically just ordered the whole canon. <laughs> That's how I am. Um, yes? Good. Very good. Ah. Yeah. Very, very, yes, yes, yes. Why, well, I'm gonna abridge. Yes, yes, very big sutta. Don't worry. <laughs> we have all night. <laughs> no problem. Huh? Like the Buddha said, we usually deliver discourses to the sunrise almost. Huh? No problem. <laughs> I was saying I compulsively bought the whole canon and then, um, actually the Dhammapada really brought a lot of faith for me, a lot of sadha. And I realized, because I used to, I was, I was a yogi then, so I was really into Hinduism, and uh, I was reading the Bhagavad Gita, and the uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and that was my Bible for a while. And when I came upon the Dhammapada, then I realized, like, this is what I've been looking for. Um, all that wisdom from the Buddha directly, uh, after looking for so long. 
I was really amazed. And then I ordered the Canon and then I started, I looked it up, I looked up, uh, okay, so where, where does it start? Because I didn't know. Uh, it's, it's a little bit tricky with the Canon to know where to start <laughs> if you don't know anything. So did a little Google research. And, uh, <laughs> and then I found out that the Diga Nikaya is supposed to be the first book. So I opened the, f the first book and then I read the table of contents and then it was Potapada States of Consciousness. This was uh, Maurice Walsh's uh, translation. And then I was, okay, you know, this is what I want to read. And then I opened up the, so th this was my first sutta and I think to this day is still my uh, favorite sutta. That is, uh, it's quite, quite complete. Uh, we're not going to go through the whole thing, <laughs> don't worry. It's very, uh, it has a lot of, uh, it's a wide ranging, lot of, very uh, full spectrum analysis of uh, perceptions and the self and all these uh, theories around that. But there is a really amazing description of the jhanas in this, in this particular sutta. And this actually was the first time that I received an explanation with the jhanas, which was my first, uh, first time reading the jhanas, in fact. And reading about the cessation of perceptual or experiential awareness. Uh, this is Abhi Sanya Niroda, or sometimes called Sanya Vedaita Niroda. And this is a very, very interesting concept, or which, if we can call it that, but because uh, it's supposed to be the end of concepts as well. And it seems that uh, this is a teaching very particular to the Buddhas. That is, just so to make clear, that is Nibbana. That is the cessation of basically of consciousness or perceptual awareness. But to say the word cessation can, can seem a little nihilistic. Uh, I would use perhaps more the word release, the liberation, the freedom from all this mental activity. And when I read this, I was really struck uh, to hear the Buddha's entire path up to the end there and which I had no idea. At that time I was practicing a, a particular kind of vipassana meditation and we never talked about these things. We never talked about jhanas, let alone nirodha samapati. So, yes, it's probably better to uh, leave the notions uh, that you've heard about jhana <laughs> and to uh, listen to the suttas and the buddha vachana. Um, yeah, I don't want to go too far into that, but um, these, these, these levels of meditation are, have been ma made into something very esoteric and inaccessible uh, because of one-pointed types of concentrated uh, focus meditations. Uh, and that is one of the big differences with what we practice here uh, and our teacher Bhante Vimal Ramsey's uh, discovery uh, going back to the suttas because uh, he was practicing a, a certain kind of vipassana uh, meditation that uh, is very popular nowadays and uh, which is very much based on the Abhidhamma and the commentaries, the Atakatta and the Tikka and the Visuddhimagga. And uh, these, these methods have um, evolved their own understanding uh, of the Buddha's words and they have uh, scaffolded their own structures basically around using some of the same terms but then when when we start practicing in that way we need to use their structure and if we move away from that then it creates a lot of problems because uh, 
the Buddha's words just don't seem to point in the same direction. <laughs> so, um, that, that's one thing that happens when we try to systematize uh, the Buddha's teaching. Uh, and it's been done since the very, very early times. Uh, we can start to see these kind of compendiums arising with the Patisambhita Magga and then forward and forward into time uh, with the Visuddhi Magga and all these like the Vimutti Magga. Uh, all wonderful attempts, I'm sure, to systematize because, because as you know, the, the canon, the whole, uh, the, the, the Pitaka, is very hard to know where to start. There's no structure to it. So that's, that's the weakness, basically, of the suttas. And since the very beginning, since very early on, many people have tried to systematize this teaching, to make it more simple, to make it more accessible. But the thing is that Buddhism hasn't gone through, you know, it wasn't easy for the past 2,600 years almost. <laughs> so there's been wars, there's been famines, there's been lots of challenges. The reason why the Sutta Pitaka was put down on palm leaf manuscripts in Sri Lanka was because Sri Lanka was going through a 12 year famine and le monks were eating leaves off the trees and trying to survive. So they thought, hmm, we might not have this teaching around for very long, so we should probably write it down. <laughs> because it was only oral tradition at that time. And that was really early on. That was very, very early on. This is like thousands of years ago. First century BCE. Uh huh? First century BCE. First century BCE, yes, yes. Like 2,000 years ago almost, yeah. So that's not even talking about the next 2,000 years. So, <laughs> so obviously, uh, it, it, it only makes sense that we've, we, only, we, we have only you know, um, some remnants or, or the, the teaching. We still have the teaching, which is just amazing after all this time. But to expect that it hasn't changed or it hasn't been interpreted in so many different kinds of ways, it would just be like unrealistic really. But this is why uh, we, in this tradition particularly, we're extremely fond of the suttas because we have practiced, most of us have practiced the other methods before, the methods that are based on the commentaries and the exegetical uh, works and we've noticed that there were quite large discrepancies between these later texts and the Buddha's words so uh, this is why we want to keep it as close as we can to the Buddha's words and when we speak about jhana that's why I, I like it here too is because Jan just means to meditate, and that's what jhana means. That, that's that's it. It's, it's not. It's not. It doesn't mean absorption. Uh, the word apanna is not really a word that the Buddha uses in the suttas. The word um, upachara samadhi is not a word that the Buddha uses. Kanika samadhi is not a word that the Buddha uses. Uh, so there is the Buddha is extremely skillful and teaches with wonderful similes and analogies and imagery that are very rich, wealthy, and really inspiring. And I think this is probably uh, what we want to stay closest to. Uh, personally, I, I really like uh, Bhikkhu Sujato's interpretation of the word jhana uh, in etymology. Um, he, he, he's proposing that basically the word jhana comes from, well, the root dhi. And dhi is uh, found twice in the Gayatri Mantra. Uh, and the Gayatri Mantra is actually referred to by the Buddha. In, in the, the verses, um, he says, 
of all hymns, the Savitri is. I've never heard. Oh, of all, of all, of all, of all hymns. Ah, oh, okay. So of all, of all hymns, the the Savitri or Gayatri, I can't remember which one he's using, but is the highest basically uh, of, of all hymns and then he says of all something else is the highest and then I can't remember the whole verse but he's basically comparing uh, a few things and so <clears throat> because obviously uh, just just like Buddhism uh, 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 the Vedas and Vedanta uh, philosophies uh, have also grown a lot uh, and been very deeply influenced by the Buddha's teaching as well. But um, at the time of the Buddha, the, the, the Vedas were a lot s smaller than what we have today. And <laughs> yes, yes. And um, the Gayatri Mantra has uh, the root D comes twice, basically. Uh, it, and it was, it, it was known at the time of the Buddha, and it makes sense that the Buddha probably, because he took a lot of things out of uh, this, this philosophy, um, and turned it into the right, right view, basically, right understanding. And so it would make sense that uh, he would borrow kind of, a, because the word jhana or dhyan uh, doesn't really appear that much before the Buddha, like the word Samadhi. The word Samadhi is another word that we can't find in the Vedas before, uh, or not that I've searched uh, for. And so this, 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 this hymn is like uh, recited by the Brahmins in the morning, the rising sun, and uh, is a hymn to the sun, basically to enlighten us, to enlighten us, to give us vision, basically, to make us see uh, things. Uh, and I think that's a beautiful analogy for the word jhana. And my understanding of the word jhana is actually a lot more closer to insight <laughs> than, than, than the other words used for insights. For me, the word jhana is actually is a level of meditation, but it's a level of understanding. It's a level of insight into your own mind. As some qualities arise, and as the releasing process happens, these pass away and other qualities arise. And this is what you're seeing. This is that D. And so, with that wisdom, uh, we're allowed the deeper insight into our the, the nature of our own minds and that's jhana to me anyways that's uh, that's what i came up with <laughs> i i could speak about this for a long time <laughs> we should better start the sutta uh, <laughs> and before we before we start uh, i just want to uh, there's a little disclaimer um, if you're practicing forgiveness right now, don't get hung up on the fact that you're not experiencing this or you think you're or you think you're not experiencing this or things like that. It's really not true. Like forgiveness meditation, once it is done properly, I've seen people fly through this whole path like extremely quickly. So still pay attention and um, make sure that you, you hear the words and uh, maybe you won't be able to relate to every single thing, but that's okay because when you're gonna experience it later, you'll remember. So it's all good. And don't, don't think, uh, don't feel like you're left behind or anything. You're very much on the train with all of us. <laughs> so. And when I read the sutta, for the first time, um, I had a very profound experience uh, happen to me, and so um, uh, I wish you the same and uh, have a good uh, listening. <laughs> 
So thus have I heard, once the awakened one was living at Sawati, another Pindika's monastery in Jeta's Grove. At that time, the wanderer Potapada was staying in the arena for debate in Queen Malika's open hall, nestled amidst the tall, pale moon ebony trees, together with a respected company of some 30 wanderers. Then, sometime in the morning, having dressed up and taking his bowl and robe, the awakened one set out to Savati for alms. Then the thought came to him, it is very early to go for alms in Savati. Perhaps I could go to the arena for debate where Potapada and the wanderers are staying. So this was a common thing, as you probably all know, to go to the debating halls and to see what the other people have to say about what they practice. And he did so. At that time, Potapada and the company of wanderers were sitting together, agitated, making an uproar, a great deal of noise, talking about countless unedifying subjects, animal talk, tirachana katta. <laughs> just like this one <laughs> such talk as about kings thieves ministers army horror stories battle food drinks clothes beds jewelry perfumes family vehicles travel town cities countries women liquor street gossip water well gossip talk of the departed, talk about differences, speculation about the world, speculations about the sea, talk about this, talk about that. They didn't have talk of coronavirus at that time. <laughs> coronavirus Qatar. No. <laughs> no problem then, with the good old days. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. One of the one of the few. Then ah Corona Corona Kata. Then Potapada saw the Buddha arriving from afar and sought his own company to settle down. Be quiet, good sirs. Do not make a sound, good sirs. The recluse Gotama is coming this way. The venerable delights in silence. He speaks praise of silence. He sees that if he sees that this company is silent, he might consider approaching it. This being said, the wanderers fell silent. Then as the Buddha approached, Potapada said, Come Bhagawan, welcome Bhagawan. Alas, Bhante, the awakened one has come out of his way to come here. Please be seated, Bhagawan. A sitting place is prepared. Then the Bhagawan sat down and pre on, on the prepared seat. Then Potapada took a low seat next to him. And the Buddha asked, What were you all talking about sitting together here? When this was said, Potapada replied, Leave this aside, this, leave, leave this talk of ours aside, Bhante. It won't be hard for the awakened one to hear about such things later. <laughs> Earlier in the day, when many monks and Brahmins were, were here at the ashram, all gathered and sitting, this question arose. How is there, sirs, the complete release from awareness? Hmm, slightly different kind of question. So this is this Abhi Sanya Niroda. And uh, just to me, that just that they would start talking about this is quite unusual. And I think that the word of the Buddha's teaching probably was spreading around because I don't think this was a, su a subject uh, known at this point, at, at that time, the, the, the extinction, basically, of sanya. Uh, so, 
just that they're speaking of this and they're so that's probably why he's seeing the Buddha and he's thinking oh now maybe the Buddha could answer this question because it's probably from him so <laughs> oh, uh, okay so maybe this is a question for the Pali scholars then as well but uh, basically I'm curious why it's Abhisanyam Nerodo instead of the and like why Sanyam and not Vijnana or I don't know yeah. yeah why is it the end of perception and not consciousness you mean the Sanya is not just perception uh -huh. so in my understanding on the, unless you know the answer and that was just no, okay no. okay so that that's the, that's one of the the tricky part about translating sanya also uh, so when you translate the suttas or like you read the suttas a lot in pali you notice that the word sanya is is one of these words that is really hard to translate basically uh, it's one of like like the word sankara it seems like there are instances in the canon where because I also was coming from this place where sanya is like concept and actually in a lot of my translations um, I translated that as concepts which I'm slowly changing now but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it takes a long time to go back and <laughs> um, but because I noticed that in some instances it didn't work as well if you change it to concepts then uh, there's there's some places where it, uh, it actually um, the meaning changes like it's not the same thing it's like if uh, sometimes the Buddha uses that as like sanya as awareness or like like this like cognition or like I think one of the the suttas that has the closest to def defining all of these is uh, I think it's Kajaniya Sutta like the in the Sanyutta Nikaya it's in the the Kanda Kanda Samyutta and uh, it 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 says like what are you know uh, what is form and then it says that uh, uh, rupa uh, kinchi kinchi rupa and uh, rupa rupati uh, it says like is there's a play on the word and then and then the, he explains all the the khandas and sanya and consciousness are like pretty much the same it's like it knows like sanya what does it do like it knows it knows that this is red this is blue and then and then he says consciousness what does consciousness do well it is conscious it is conscious this is like pungent this is sour this is so it's like what's the difference you know <laughs> Yes. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Sanya or Vinyana. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I see like consciousness as more like a kind of a global, like all encompassing thing, whereas Sanya is more like this sense of like knowing things. But not necessarily like database but also just like knowingness kind of thing okay. we're clearly going beyond all of it though so <laughs> in this sutta <laughs> and uh, here I will jump ahead to uh, where the jhanas start from the sequence of uh, Dhamma Samadhi and this is this whole sequence now there's a bit of philosophizing uh, involved here between like all oh, these people say that this is how it happens this other people say this is how it happens and it gets really heady and uh, we're just gonna skip that <laughs> and uh, then there he the Buddha explained his whole path because he's like okay I'll, t I'll show you how it works you know, so he goes and he talks about the virtue like gaining faith in the Buddha and then the virtues and then uh, basically how to protect the mind and then um, the same sequence as the Samanya Palla Sutta basically and now we're arriving at the jhana so I'm skipping all of this which is really long and we're arriving at 
when these five hindrances are abandoned, tasime panche nivarane pahine, because of the, uh, one sees clearly within oneself and relief wells up. Because of that relief comes joy. From that joy in one's mind, one's body becomes calm. With a calm body, one experiences happiness. And with one's happy mind comes collectedness. Now, first jhana. Disengage from outwards desires or sensory engagement and detached from unwholesome states of mind, still accompanied with active thinking and reflection, vitaka vichara, with the joy and happiness born of letting go, sama viveka jangpi tisukkam. One experiences and abides in the first level of meditation. At that time, those perceptions that one previously had from sensory engagement fade away. So that's what it means to enter this state, is that we're not engaging in the senses anymore. This is quite clear. This is uh, karma. And basically, we're just sitting down, eyes closed, uh, and we're experiencing this Viveka Jampi Tisukkang, this gladness, this joy and happiness that comes from letting go of, of the senses and also letting go of the hindrances, which were like if there's impatience in the mind, if there's like grogginess, if there's anger. You know, for a little bit of time, if you bring up the metta, for example, uh, as we saw earlier the, in the uh, Achara Sangata Sutta, finger snap is if you have loving kindness in your heart for the time of a finger snap you are not devoid of jhana and so when you're sitting down eyes closed you let go of the senses you bring up a smile and you genuinely feel the metta and you have a little bit of joy arising you're you're pretty close <laughs> Actually, this is, uh, this is really good because I think this is one of the places where I take my translation as sanya as awareness. Um, because there is, he says, kama sanya. Yes. So, kama concepts, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. So, it's like, well, why would you like conceptualize about these things? It's more like you're aware of them or you're engaging. And then, just the kama sanya is nirujati. Huh? There we go. Done away with. <laughs> Good. Now I'm relinking back to my whole tra train of thought about this whole yeah translation work. It's always <laughs> lots of sankaras. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I think that's where I also take it from. Um, at that time those perceptions that one previously had from sensory engagement kama sanya sees nirujati at that time there is a subtle but true perception of joy and happiness that comes from letting go viveka jang piti sukkam and at that time, one becomes conscious of this subtle but true perception of joy and happiness that comes from letting go. In this way, some perceptions arise through practice and some perceptions cease through practice. Hmm. And this is that practice. What is the practice? Ah, six R, very good. <laughs> good students <laughs> so one of the major criti critics that we get uh, in this uh, in this particular way of practice is that it's too fast it's it's too easy and it's too fast that's what people will say usually yeah <laughs> like for sure that's the number one critic I mean when I was gonna go ordain at Paok in Myanmar 
uh, I was told that as a monk, meditating five to six hours every day, just being a monk and just doing that, I, on average, people would reach the first jhana after a year or two. And so all the jhanas would be experienced relatively within a, a time frame of 10 to 15 years, usually all the jhanas. And that's meditating at least five hours every day, which is like a, a bare minimum in that particular style. And that's, that's what I was signing up for anyways at that time. And so I understand this, this psychology. I understand where these people are coming from and it, I understand. But <clears throat> the reality is uh, this, when we read the suttas directly, um, it's very different. It's very, uh, it seems like, well, you know, the Buddha is explaining all of these states and um, when, when we read the sutta, like uh, the Achara Sangata Sutta, like the finger snap, like we have the loving kindness for the time of a finger snap, then we're not devoid of meditation, we're not devoid of jhana. Then there seems to be like, well, when we're just detached from karma, when we're just detached from uh, sensory engagement, and we're detached from unwholesome states, when we let those go, then there is that relief, there is that joy that arises, that pamojang, that piti sukkang, that arises from viveka, from letting go, detaching. And it seems not so crazy, you know? <laughs> it doesn't seem so, it seems quite human and accessible. And it, it, in my understanding, it's because we've lost this crucial understanding of how the jhanas really work that we've lost a bit the path nowadays. Because if we don't have jhana in our practice, we don't have the Eightfold Path. Like, it's not complete. And if the jhanas take two years for a monk to attain the first one, then forget about the path, you know? Like it's, that's why they, now people talk, talk about, oh, well, I'll just build my param paramis for like, and hopefully in many lifetimes I'll be able to get there, you know? But that's just not true. And it's, it's experienceable here and now. Like this teaching is not, of course there's a way of doing this and there are steps to, to experience, but it's not that esoteric at all. And the people, uh, first of all, the people that you will usually say this, that this is too easy, this is too quick, first of all, they haven't tried it. <laughs> That's always the first thing that happens to me anyways. Um, and the second thing is, is it that easy? And is it that quick? Because really, it takes about three days to usually, <laughs> in my experience, every retreat is the same, roughly. It takes three to four days for people. Yes, you can, you can experience this like um, uh, in a fleeting manner. You can like touch upon it and then it goes, and then touch upon it and then it goes. And if you don't really know the six R's really well, if you don't know the release and relax, bring up the smile, bring up the joy, the happiness, the metta. Actually, yeah, I could see why people would miss that. I could, it could be hard to actually tap into and that you need three full days of retreat just to stabilize that base. So the first day, the second day, usually people will touch and go. That's what will happen. And you'll spend much more time with distractions and states, unwholesome states. And it's not that you're not practicing, it's just that you're purifying your mind and slowly it opens up and it blooms. But it's, it's not a quick, quick process and you have to understand how the mind works. You have to understand what are distractions. Distractions are simply showing you what's in your mind. They're not, they're not to be pushed away, they're not to be suppressed, they're your teachers. They're showing you what's going on in there. <laughs> so, 
as you learn to work with the six R's with right effort properly, then slowly after three days of full retreat, it starts to become stable. And now people are spending more time in that base than outside of it. Even though we're still, we've been practicing the same thing over and over again, but now it's starting to stay, it's starting to stick a little bit more. And so this is why we're talking about this tonight, because now we can see what the mind will do, all the stages it will go through. To me, the first jhana is more like uh, an in-between state where uh, there, is, there is some thinking involved, there's some reflection involved, there's like bringing up more like the spiritual friend, there's like all these, these things that we're bringing up basically. It's an active kind of state and it's still one of the stages of meditation and see, you see here it's quite active, vitaka vichara, I mean it's still a word today, you know, vichara. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's very, like, it, it's not like this, you know, very, like, crazily different state. It's just that there's only wholesome states at this point, and that's what it is. And then there's that joy. And when we uh, are on interviews, we, we never tell you where you are in the meditation or anything, but the first thing that we're looking for is the joy. And how... Uh, how much people are smiling and how much it's getting, oh, the corners are lifting up and they're staying there quite a bit. <laughs> and then we get it, oh, okay, good, good, very good. Now they're starting to understand. <laughs> and so, and then as this starts to become more and more stable, then the next level is even more released, even more uplifted. And to do that, we need to drop so much thinking, you know, always bringing up objects and always thinking about this or that. Even though it's wholesome, there's many suttas, the Buddha explains this process, even if you were to think about really wholesome things, at some point you need to calm that down for the meditation to continue. If I could just add something, yes, yes. a couple people in the interviews still using a verbal mantra almost and some other meditation techniques that do loving kindness use this may I be happy or may you be happy and repeating over and over again but like Bhante said that if you don't drop the phrase eventually and just stay with the feeling it doesn't allow the mind to go deeper into the second jhana yes so this is um, this is one of the first places when we were talking about um, making a, sh a sheet where all the places where we can get stuck in the meditation. <laughs> that's, I think that's one of the first ones. Is repeating, because basically nowadays, like, like Metananda was saying, um, nowadays uh, metta meditation is mostly taught like, oh, may you be happy, may all beings in, in front of me be happy, may they be protected, may they be well, may they, be, uh, may they have everything that they need, may everybody on the, to the west or like at the back. Uh, and it's continually repeating phrases and uh, it's believed that the metta doesn't go that deep nowadays, but it's not true, it's just because people are not dropping the phrases. <laughs> <laughs> they're just continually thinking and they're not there's no relaxed step there's no release so there's no deepening in the metta so that's why it's misunderstood that's why people think oh metta it's just like you know this practice you do after a 10 day retreat for 10 minutes and that's it but it's not true it, it's actually a really important practice that the Buddha taught so it's probably good to emphasize as well, I wonder if you'd agree with this, that like if, if the object is becoming too heavy for the mind, mm -hmm. like uh, the spiritual, it's not about the spiritual friend as much as it is the feeling. Uh -huh. So if the object gets too heavy and you're just in with the feeling and the mind just wants to be with that, uh -huh. you know, just letting go of those objects if they're kind of weighing things down. Yeah more and more in this meditation what really matters is the feeling 
the feeling of metta, the feeling of maitri. It's not your spiritual friend, it's not the puppy, it's not the goat, even though I love goats. There was a pack of goats this morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I heard like, oh, goats, bakri. <laughs> <laughs> we had some uh, we had a goat pen in Bud Buddha Pada. We went to feed the goats almost every day. Well, venerable did. <laughs> and so um, but whatever the object is, it, it's just a tool. We're using it as a tool to bring the feeling. But as we use that, then the feeling gets nurtured and all the unwholesome states on the side come fall in. And then the wholesome metta will start to boil up, float up. And just this is enough at that point. If you feel the feeling, that's badia. Very good. Excellent. That's what we want. And if the feeling goes away for some reason and you can't really bring it back, then you can go back down and use, you know, really recollecting things like vitaka vichara. But then once you have the feeling again, it doesn't matter so much. You just float on the feeling, fly your wings. Then Potapada, with the calming of active thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, one's mind becoming unified without active thinking and reflection with the joy and happiness born of mental collectedness samadhi jang piti sukkham one experiences and abides the second level of meditation at that time the subtle but true perception that one previously had of joy and happiness from letting go ceases or fades away. At that time, there is a subtle but true perception of joy and happiness that comes now from mental collectedness. At that time, one becomes conscious of this subtle but true perception of joy and happiness born of mental collectedness. In this way, some perceptions arise through practice and some perceptions cease through practice. And this is that practice. What is the practice? Six hours. Six hours. Very good. <laughs> okay. And so, the, what is the difference here? There um, was there... I, I just I just like to point point out here was there samadhi in the first one there's no mention of samadhi in the first one there is no mention of eko di bhavang in the first one there is no mention of ikagata in the first one so it's really interesting because the first one is about letting go it's about viveka that's the joy and happiness. And that's when you let go the tension in your head. You go, ah, viveka jangpi tisukka. Okay. And then now it goes beyond that. And now you've done that a lot. You basically let go, let go, let go, release, relax, smile, metta. And then at some point you do it so much that the mind it just starts to trickle it starts to pool it starts to gather and you're not forcing this you're not putting your attention on an object or focusing on something or not at all it's happening through wisdom through discernment and you know to let go of distractions when mind goes batakla uh -huh. <laughs> Six hour batakla, then, <laughs> then metta bhavana, uh, smityasna, smit, smityase, smityase, majakara. Uh. <laughs> oh, very good. Ha, <laughs> phew, I got it. <laughs> 
<laughs> then samadhi jang thiti sukkam as we do this over and over again then the mind starts to become collected why because it's happy because it's joyful when the mind is happy and joyful it's not looking for other places to look for happiness it doesn't care about uh, I don't know uh, it doesn't care about a, a glass of juice it's not thinking about a glass of juice it's just not interested it's just so happy with the metta and it's enjoying the smiling and it's just pouring in from inside and in this particular the second jhana is actually a simile that the Buddha gives which I really like is the simile of the lake a beautiful lake which has no inlet no water coming in from anywhere but from under there's a source welling up from within and that is the source welling up from within it doesn't it doesn't want other things it, the sources are not coming in from the outside they're coming in you're getting your own happiness and that's why I call it the alchemy of the mind now you're transforming all of your mental states into this beautiful fountain of gold basically and you, you don't need happiness from outside anymore you're generating it so you become the richest people on this planet <laughs> and with the wisest investment of your happiness because all the other happinesses they can be ripped away from you very quickly very easily but this one you don't need anything you can just sit somewhere I was sitting in the bathroom today and I was dunking buckets of water on my head and I was sitting on the tiles and I was really enjoying my life <laughs> like, no problem Chaliga. <laughs> so so I mean if you can be happy then I mean nothing's gonna stop you like you're the wealthiest person in the world it's amazing look at this guy <laughs> So, and you're all going to be like that. So, that's amazing. Okay, I'll stop there. Bathroom jang ti ti sukang. Very good. Yes, yes. Unstoppable happiness. <laughs> it's very good. Okay. <laughs> I like to uh, liken it to like a bucket of water that has many holes in it and then slowly you're starting to patch the holes and slowly you're, you're starting to notice that oh like this the water is it's easy for it to stay now and you have a lot more you know this uh, samadhi is like this mental clarity also at this level is like now there's no much, not much uh, vitaka, vichara, there's not much, you know, still, even though it's wholesome, there's still this wavering in the mind, but then that stops, and then it becomes very like this. And this is very, very enjoyable. And now the joy comes from that, mostly. This is where we start to notice, this samadhi will become more and more it will become more potent more present but this is now that we're starting to see it this clarity beautiful clarity of mind and the object of meditation the metta becomes fairly fairly good we, we start to be able to maintain this for a few minutes now of course the mind will go batakla a little bit but we it's easy then we we'll go 6R and then come back and then it stays for a while and then and then of course there's up and downs more bigger distractions but mostly it will be fine 
And now with the calming of stronger joy, abiding in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness within one's body or ease within one's body. That state which the liberated people, the awakened people describe as steady presence of mind is a pleasant abiding. One experiences and abides in the third level of meditation. At that time, the subtle but true perception that one previously had of joy and happiness that comes from mental collectedness fades away. I like to use the word fade away here and not ceases because it's not clear cut. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen all of a sudden. It just kind of fades away, fades down. At that time, there is a subtle but true perception of bliss of steady awareness. And at that time, one becomes conscious of this subtle yet true perception of the bliss of steady awareness. In this way, some perceptions arise through practice and some perceptions cease or fade away through practice. And this is that practice. What is the practice? Ah, very good. They're not, they're not sleeping. Very good. Ah. And so here, what happens is that now the mind started to become collected. And what mostly happens here is it, the mind starts to become very steady. And this is the beginning of Upeka, basically. It's, uh, it's starting. It's not fully mature yet, but it's, we're starting to feel this really beautiful, this bliss of a steady mind, which can not which can remain aware, but without forcing it to, just because it's purified. And this is quite, quite amazing. This is an amazing uh, place to start to experience because at this point, you only need this steady awareness and you understand that this purified awareness because Basically, why is it steady? Because there's no more distractions. There's no more white noise in the mind. So it becomes very bright, very steady on its own. And you're not forcing this. It happened through your own wisdom of six Ring, basically. Letting go of the distractions and bringing up states that nurture this stability of mind. And so at this point, you start to understand, hmm, this is, this is pretty nice. This is, this is a good state to be in. Uh, very free and open kind of happiness. Unattached to pleasant sensations and unsteered by unpleasant ones. As mental excitement and heaviness settles, one's mind becomes balanced, purified by unmoving presence. One understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. At that time, the subtle yet true perception that one previously had of the bliss of steady awareness fades away. And at that time, there there is a subtle yet true perception that is beyond pleasant and unpleasant sensations. At that time, one becomes conscious of this subtle but true perception that is beyond pleasant and unpleasant sensations. And my understanding of this is mainly uh, from the body, basically, because um, in the next step we will see that this body awareness fades away. In this way, some perceptions arise through practice and some perceptions fade away through practice. And this is that practice. 
And what is the practice? Six R's. K R's. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So now, um, this is a step where we have, we're studying a new transition where now the mind is basically it's starting to be very detached it's starting to be very steady very balanced and the seven factors of awakening are still at play there's still the PET there's still the you know, Pasadi so the joy is still there but it's just it's matured and it's matured into a much calmer kind of joy it's just uh, much more calm and the mind really delights more and more in that calmness and from around there on I usually call joy or the awakening factor of PT I start calling it more like bliss because the joy is more active, it's more like uh, excited and the bliss is just more like this uh, you know, this, this steady uh, if you could like play that over and over again kind of thing that would be like the, the bliss of Upeka basically And so from here, the mind starts to detach from uh, bodily experiences, bodily sensations. And it's not really invested so much in what the body will feel. Because when the mind becomes steady, the, mind, the body also becomes quite steady. You, you notice uh, a lot of the times at the beginning of the retreat, people will move a lot. People will shift. And just because of bhavana, just because of mental de development and mind becoming uplifted, mind becoming very, very wholesome, the body doesn't feel the need to move that much. It's just very still and happy. Actually, it doesn't, doesn't really want to move. It's just standing there. So she says, Samaya for Sutta, there's a simile given yes. of a white cloth. When yes. you are on, under that white cloth, yes. you're not you know, worried about any other. Ah, yes. You are inside that. Mm, yes. And you know, nothing uh, yes. makes any difference to you. Yes. And it's just a very light touch on all the body. So it's not, it's not very, you know, coarse. It's very just like touching. And that's a, an experience that we're actually looking for in, in people at this point, is body awareness is starting to get lighter. Uh, so a lot of you, anyways, this morning on the interview, some of you have mentioned uh, lightness, lightness in the body. And this is a good sign, lightness in the body or um, the body becoming uh, um, I was going to say lighter but <laughs> invisible, yes slowly, slowly dire, dire. Uh, the body starts to kind of uh, lose its compactness lose its heaviness and so this is actually a sign that we're looking for and one thing uh, I'd like to mention at this point is that um, the metta, metta bhavana here, uh, this is the last station. The fourth jhana is the last station of the metta. Because at this point, I didn't say anything so far, but each of these levels is accompanied with loving kindness, is accompanied with the metta. But the metta also changes. As we're going to 6R and the mind is going to change through these levels of insight, these levels of understanding how the mind works as it becomes released, then the metta will also change, obviously, because the mind is changing. The mind is getting lighter, the mind is getting steadier, so the metta will get lighter, the metta will get steadier, and it will get more subtle, and we need to allow it 
to become more subtle as well. And now I can say this, it's been day four now. If, if I were to say this on the first day or second day, then it wouldn't work because then it would go to more. Because <laughs> we need a little bit more active you know, uh, activity, bringing it up and making sure it stays. And then at some point, you know, the, the little bird, the little bird starts to take off. And then it beats his wings. But if we, if we say that and say, oh, allow it to uh, go softer too early, then it's not helpful. But at this point, I would say most of everybody here is experiencing that and the bird is ready to kind of just glide on the metta and of course there will be some distractions but not as big as before and um, it's good at this point it's good to understand the direction where this is going it is going towards release more and more so that's where we say this meditation is not just a metta meditation. We start with the metta. Metta is like the highway. It's a very wholesome conduit of wholesome states. And it will bring us there very quickly. But it's not only a metta meditation. And at this point, the metta will become so subtle that it loses its consistency. It cannot really go further because metta is too involved. It's too, I love everybody, yay. <laughs> and at this point, the mind just wants to calm down. It just wants the, the peace of calm, basically. So the metta will have to, ch it will change. And it will change and it will get lighter. And that's normal. That's good, in fact. So don't. Um, it's important not to, and that's another place where people can get stuck, um, is uh, trying to basically bring the metta because they're like, oh, it's getting softer, I'm losing it, and then wanting to bring it more and bring it more, but then, but then where, where does that go? It doesn't, it doesn't get deeper, it doesn't go towards more release and then somebody gets stuck there basically with that stronger metta which is not an unwholesome state but if you want to experience the deeper stages of this meditation you need to six r even even the metta at this point and it will change into a softer feeling which is really similar to metta but is more distant is more uh, away and this is not always seen by everybody, so don't worry if you don't see that, but it will change into more like a compassion feeling. Because compassion is a bit more distant. Sometimes it feels more like uh, compassion has a tinge of, you know, of difficulty in it most of the time. And now here at this point we're talking about uh, a very subtle kind of compassion. There is stronger compassion, yes. But at this point, it's simply like the highest kind of compassion where it's just going to be like loving kindness, but a little bit more detached, a little bit more, a uh, little less involved than the metta. So slowly, we're kind of giving that up. And I just want to mention that uh, we're not making this up. Uh, <laughs> We take this transition uh, from one Brahma Vihara to the other, the Metta to the Karuna Mudita Upeka, from a sutta called Metta Sahagata Sutta in the Bhojanga Samyutta, Samyutta Nikaya. So I can't remember the number exactly, but I think 46? Something like that. You have to look. That's another critic we have a lot, is that nowadays metta is thought to be uh, only uh, thought to be reaching only third jhana. So uh, and we say you know practicing practicing metta till the fourth jhana, which is usually uh, I think it's from the Abhidhamma maybe or something like that. That somehow nowadays it's believed that metta only goes to the third jhana. 
with absorption concentration. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, anyways, last time I looked in these, when I was practicing and I was reading uh, Pao Xairo's book, I think, The Light of Wisdom, which is, anyways, uh, but in, in that sutta, the Metta Sahagata, you can find basically the, the source for this whole, the, the skeleton for this whole practice, basically. Tell, the Buddha tells um, the limit of each Brahma Vihara. It's like a, one of the most advanced Brahma Vihara teaching that the Buddha gave, basically. And uh, where the limit of each, and he says that the Subha, Subha is the fourth jhana, is the limit of metta. Basically. And then Karuna is uh, the plane of endless space and uh, Mudita is endless consciousness and then Upeka is nothingness. Basically. And this is where we take our source from, that very Sutta. So later Potapada, going beyond the perception of form with the awareness of the senses fading away, turning away from the awareness of plurality, complexity, aware of endless space, one understands and abides in this, the plane of endless space. At that time, the subtle but true perception that one previously had of physicality ceases. Rupa, Rupa Sanya. At that time, there is a subtle but true perception of endless spaciousness. And at that time, one becomes conscious of this subtle yet true perception of endless spaciousness. In this way, some perceptions arise through practice and some perceptions cease through practice. And this is that practice. What is the practice? Ah, very good, good. Not sleeping. Very good. <laughs> um, and so here, this is um, this is where some really interesting start things start to happen. Basically, in the meditation, this is a big uh, intersection where uh, bodily awareness starts to really fade away, and it's uh, quite noticeable. Uh, there's not really as mind will release most of its uh, coarser perceptions, its coarser sanyas, like rupa sanya, it will lose interest in the body because it's uh, this uh, jnana, what is the Pali for that again? The nanatta sanya, like complexity, like so many things happening in the body. It's always going on in there. And the mind is just not interested anymore because samadhi is starting to pool even more and more and more. And this is just more and more pleasant to just be away from all of this complicated thing and to just rest here. And so this is also where we say that the feeling of metta goes up to the head. And this is normal. When that happens to you, don't try to push it back down. It's like um, when the metta becomes subtle, don't try to like bring it back up strongly again. It's normal that it will become subtler. And then it's normal that it will only become in the head here because um, the body is too much for the mind at this point. And the mind just wants just this calm, calm mind. And it will be a kind of a distant, like a distant kind of loving kindness, but a, still a tinge of it. But more and more leaning towards it, more like a simple like joy. It's like a simple joy. And mind doesn't have a body. Mind is mind. Body is body. And when mind lets go of even the body awareness, then the first thing it experiences is spaciousness. 
because mine doesn't have a body. And the first thing it notices is like, wow, there's so much space here. <laughs> because it's not limited, it doesn't have boundaries anymore that thinks like, oh, this is like what's going on right now, like this is me. It's just like open. So this is another thing that we're looking for is not only the body kind of fading away in the background. If you put your attention on your knee or your feet, you're going to feel them. Or if a fly lands on you, you're going to feel it. But mostly, you're not going to be interested with bodily awareness. And that's another place where uh, so somebody can get stuck is uh, like uh, that happens a lot with uh, some Vipassana students who hold on to the sensations in the body even with, when there's loving kindness but if one would bring up these sensations again one doesn't go deeper so it's very important that we actually move beyond these Vedanas these bodily sensations and the mind becomes only collected here and doesn't really want to get involved with all of this and at that point it experiences just this beautiful spaciousness. It can be a feeling of expansion or it can simply be a feeling of just like there's a lot of space. There's just very spacious. So everybody has a little bit different perceptions on that, but that's the general tone. Later Potapada, going beyond the plane of endless space aware of endless consciousness one understands and abides in the plane of endless consciousness at that time the subtle but true perception that one previously had of endless spaciousness fades away and at that time there is a subtle but true perception of endless consciousness and at that time one becomes conscious of this subtle but true perception of endless consciousness. In this way, some perceptions arise through practice and some perceptions fade away through practice. And this is that practice. And what is the practice? Yay! Very good. <laughs> so, at this point, what happens is, uh, like in the Metta Sahagata Sutta, the Buddha says the compassion, karuna, cannot go beyond the plane of endless spaciousness. And this is its limit. And so at this point, the, the radiant feeling will become more uh, like a feeling of joy, but a very light feeling of joy. It's a very simple feeling that uh, you're just yay <laughs> everything is fine and basically why the joy why does this joy or sympathetic joy however you want to call it but I like to call it joy because it's just more simple at this point sympathetic joy involves somebody else and it's just complicated <laughs> and joy simply means um, like the loving kindness is very involved, the compassion, there's also somebody else. There's, and there's something, you know, there's still that. And joy is just really, really simple. And it's just a very light, very easy to maintain kind of joy. And it's just radiant. Now, endless consciousness, the way that it works is that as the mind will get settled into that spaciousness, it will get used to it. It will just be like the natural place where, okay, mind is mind. There's no body and it's very spacious. And at this point where, where mind goes, as it releases even more, as we six are even more, then it will start to notice its own behavior. And this is really interesting. This is where we get very amazing insights on the nature of our own consciousness. And this will happen, some people will see some flickering, like, like uh, 
a film strip in front of a movie projector, like all these f fl uh, strips, these little images going by, and then they're starting to go slower, and you start to see each of the frames. That's one way to look at it. That's one way that you, people can see it or understand it. The other way that people can see this is simply the inside that mind is constantly active. It's never stopping. It's just constantly thinking about little things. It's just like thinking, 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 like mini na nano, nano thoughts, like proto thoughts, like miniature thoughts, baby thoughts. But it's constantly going on, constantly, constantly, endlessly. And that's the endless consciousness. And at some point, uh, this is where uh, really amazing insights on anatta in personality can also arise, where uh, a lot of people will realize, you know, I'm not in control of this. Like, I can't, I can't make this stop. I'm not in control of this consciousness that is endlessly arising and arising and arising and arising. It's like, even if you were to tell it to stop, it's not going to stop. And the only, the only thing you can do is like be aware of it and relax it and sixar and calm down even more. And so that's this stage. And don't worry, you don't have to see this. Some people don't, don't even see this. They, they'll just go even deeper right away. But it can happen and it's one of the stages. So it's too small at this point. It's too small. There's nothing really to think of. Yes. It's like. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily flickering, but it could just be like a bunch of activity happening. Yes. Nah. Nah, it's too small. At this point, it's too small. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's like uh, it's like you would you would look at the window of a car that's driving very fast. It's like <laughs> like this. You can't tell like which grain of grass is what, and you know the flowers is like just like just going by. It's too fast, too small. Yes, doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> you see, it's, it's really not that complicated. It's just basically seeing basically the stream of consciousness con continually going. But it's not, uh, there's so little craving anymore that it, it doesn't form anything. It just flows, it flows, it flows, it flows. And you can't really pick out what, what it is, like what it is it's thinking. It's just... Consciousness, that's the insight at this point, is consciousness is active, is an active principle. Uh, see? Uh, sankara pachaya vinyana. Sankara pachaya vinyana. Like, this, these activities of the mind, like, is consciousness, basically. That's, that's what is creating consciousness. And we'll see that in two uh, dependent origination talks that we'll, we'll have later. But this is how consciousness arises, is through activities that are conditioned within us. And this is when we're starting to see this at the very root level. So, yes, <laughs> it's getting interesting. Well, the last stage is kind of touching on that. So then, going beyond the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, one understands and abides in the plane of what I call bare awareness or nothingness. But the word nothingness, I find there's sometimes a little bit of confusion with people like... Uh, not, yeah, exactly, yeah. There's nothing... No, there's, 
Nothing doing. <laughs> like Goenka would say. <laughs> Nothing Trust, doing. Uh, no thingness. No, yeah, no thingness. No thingness. <laughs> but yeah, nati kinchi. Um, akincha na yadana. Akincha, like, like there's, there's nothing possessionless. There's like, there's just nothing in there. But uh, bare, bare awareness is just basically this awareness that is rid of any attributes, rid of any kind of, that's what I called, so basically before we had the movie projector and it was projecting on this strip of film and then the, now the ribbon has hit the end and then the beam is just shooting out. But there's, there's no image anymore. There's no, like, there's no consciousness, there's no, like, nothing really to land on. It's just like a straight beam shooting out. And it's just this white, clear beam. And this is what the awareness will be at this point. And at this point, there will be either equanimity, and this is another transition uh, station. There is going to be a very broad calm. Like even the joy calms down and it becomes very calm. There's still a sense of bliss, you know, it's each of these stages are better than the, the previous one in the sense of it's more enjoyable because the mind is more and more finding delight in release, basically. Because the, the end release is the ultimate bliss, basically. It's, it's, I mean, when the Buddha is awakened uh, under the Bodhi tree, he said, they say he sat down for seven days enjoying the bliss of freedom. I mean, this experience is blissful. <laughs> like, what is Dukkha Niroda if not just Sukkha 24-7? So, <laughs> and so at this point, there will be a radiant equanimity or this bare awareness is what we start calling uh, in this practice the quiet mind or the still mind. Bhante would also call it the exquisite stillness sometimes. And the mind just becomes like very, very, very still, very blissful and very free, very released. Like it's not, there's nothing happening. There's really like very little experience except just this experience of bare awareness, just aware of itself, aware of nothing in particular, just shooting out in the horizon, basically, not landing on anything. And this only happens through purification. It just becomes purer and purer and purer, and then it doesn't move, and then it just stays there. And usually this happens with around three to four hours, two and a half, three, four hours of meditation in one sit. I mean, you can't make concrete out of this, but uh, it, it, at the very beginning, that's what it's going to look like, probably, to get there. You have to understand that at this point, the meditation, the mind needs time to settle down. There is no magic pill you can take that can bring you there instantly. Um, it, it's just impossible. And the mind will need time to let go of all the layers of agitation it has and reach that place where there's really just nothing going on. Very, very clear stillness. And that's where you start thinking that this meditation is very good, <laughs> very enjoyable. And that's where you're going to see uh, some advanced meditators sit on a chair, very, you know, very, uh, very straight with a light smile, and they're going to stay there for three, four hours and just enjoying it. And they're not even going to force themselves. It's just going to be fun from the beginning till the end. 
And so that's when we start to uh, experience this a little bit more. And so at that time, the perceptions that were previously experienced that was endless consciousness, that flickering all the time, which was kind of annoying, by the way. <laughs> it's a bit like, oh, like I'm so glad this is not there anymore. Because now it's just like so simple and clear. Now it fades away. And at that time, the subtle perception of bare awareness is present. And at that time, one becomes conscious of it. And in this way, some perceptions arise through practice and some perceptions cease through practice. And this is that practice. Which is that practice? Ah, very good. You're doing great. There's no trying to imagine these. Uh, these just happen through this practice. You don't have to do anything about it. That's why we have daily interviews. It's just to make sure that whenever you're at the right gate, you'll pass through the gate and go the right direction. But there's nothing really you can do uh, about it. It's just you have to continually 6R. And then if, if it's going well, then uh, extend your meditation time a little bit more, a little bit more. When you stand up, ask yourself, why am I standing up? Why am I breaking my sit? If it's only been 40 minutes, 45 minutes, then ask yourself, hmm, what is my mind doing? Why do I need to stand up? Is it impatient? Or is it like a little bit of dislike? Like, oh, I need, I, I want something or I need to move or oh, can, can you 6R it? Does it come with tension? Can you 6R it? Can you just relax, release? It's okay. And then, and then as you go further and further without forcing but with the right understanding always extending your sit a little bit more uh, making sure that uh, you're with the right you know, the, the right object of meditation and going through all the gates. This will all happen naturally. You, you, don't, you don't really have to do anything about it. You just do the six hours and you uh, continue going along with the process that we're giving you, then you will go through these stages. And don't think this is not accessible. This is accessible. And there's usually uh, on a, like a 30 person retreat, there's usually I would say on average like probably six, seven, eight people experiencing this, you know. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, impossible at all. And if you come back to another retreat, then actually usually there is very likely to happen. <coughs> because people already know what to expect, they know what to do, and so they, they kind of, it's much faster at the beginning. So, uh, don't think this is inaccessible, uh, and also don't think that uh, you can just imagine it. And <laughs> but I don't think uh, you're doing that, so I think everybody here is doing really good. And uh, yeah, I think this is a really good retreat so far. Now there's another uh, state which is a kind of an in-between state. It's called Neva Sanya Na Sanya. And this is neither perception and non-perception. And it's not talked about in this particular sutta, even though it's kind of implied. But it, it, the, the Buddha goes through a different sequence and that's why I really like this sutta. I think it's one of the best explanation of how to enter Nirodha Samapati that I've ever heard. Uh, in the suttas, and it's quite thorough. Well, it's short, but thorough. And at this point, basically from the bare awareness, which is very still, clear, and that's why we call it the clear mind, the quiet mind, um, then the distractions are not really distractions. They're only waverings of that awareness. It's only, basically, it's so still and clear Awareness just goes like, it starts to have an inclination towards something and then we see like there's a little tension there. And then it's like, oh no, it's going. And then we 6R. But the 6Rs, even the 6Rs at this point is too much. 
It's just relax. And it just comes back there, basically. It's, it's really simple. And uh, relax, release. And then the, the whole process has, come, has become so ingrained that it's kind of happening on its own. You don't really need to think about six R's, you know. It's, like, it's just like, oh. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Do you have a better explanation? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, for me, it's more like uh, e ah. <laughs> so, and at this point, the awareness becomes so purified, so still, so clear, it loses its substance, it seems, and it goes into this kind of uh, a place where it's half dissolved basically it's half there half not there and that is neva sanya na sanya it's not really gone but it's not really there either it's so small and what I like to uh, imagine it as I, do, is there uh, what's the name of the birds the starlings there's no starlings in India no, no birds that do the same thing in India. Have you ever seen a flock of starlings flying? These little birds that make a kind of a cloud and they dance in the sky like this. And it seems like it's a cloud. And it's like a moving mass of birds, basically. And it looks like a cloud and it's moving. And that's kind of like consciousness, basically. But at this point, there's so little birds, there's so little activities in the mind that it's barely perceptible. You can't see that there's consciousness anymore. It's so small. And so at that point, sometimes, oh, the birds kind of come back and you can see that there's a bit of consciousness, but then they, they kind of spread again and then it's kind of gone. Uh, sometimes we say it's kind of like falling asleep but being aware at the same time but it's not groggy when you come out of it you're not groggy you're very sharply aware uh, and the difference sometimes you can become uh, sleepy and then you come out of it and you're like awareness is kind of dull and that's not that state so it's very uh, it's very uh, different and anyways, so that state is skipped here, and we go right into the complete dissolving of the little, little birds of clouds. Up to here, Potapada, one is conscious of oneself, and gradually, one stage after the other, one arrives at the summit of perception, understanding. Mental activity is worse for me. Freedom from mental activity would be better. If I were to incline and engage my mind in any way, these fine meditative perceptions would cease and gross perception would, seem to, would be seen to arise. So at this point, Perception is so subtle, whatever the mind is going to incline towards, it's going to start crystallizing it. It's going to start making something happen. And this comes with a little bit of tension. And at this point also we notice that awareness itself has tension in it. It has this kind of ahankara, this me, this mind. I, I am this, like this is... Awareness is like the last bastion of the ego. What we believe is, this is me. And at this point, we're starting to break that apart. We're starting to dissolve that. And we are noticing that every time the mind inclines towards something, it's actually a little bit troublesome. It's like, uh, oh no, it's better, better not to touch it. Better not to, better to 6R, better to release. 
Therefore, one does not incline nor engage one's mind in any way. When one does not engage, incline, nor forces one's mind, then uninclined and disengaged, even those finest perceptions fade away. And gross perceptions are not seen to arise. One enters cessation. This is how Potapada, the complete release from perceptual awareness, is understood and experienced gradually, step by step. What do you think, Potapada? Have you ever heard of this in the past, about the progressive experience of the complete release from perceptual awareness? No, Bhante. <laughs> And so, basically, um, we'll end the talk really soon here. <laughs> but basically what happens here is as you let go of every single sankara in the mind, sappa sankara samato, what happens is that consciousness dissolves, awareness dissolves, and that's the abhisanya nirodha. And what happens there is that you can't be conscious of this until you come out. It's like neither perception nor non-perception. The Buddha says you can't be aware of this until you kind of come out of it and have enough awareness to see that awareness was gone for a little bit. And so it's a really tricky place. And what happens is that when you come out, when you come out, when consciousness starts to, uh, it's like a, starting an old computer. You remember the old computers or you just press the button and you go like And it's exactly like that. And then you can, uh, a consciousness will start to be gross enough to, rem to see itself and to see that, oh, it was gone for a little bit. Like there was a moment like this, it happened really quickly, that there was a complete dip, there was nothing. And it comes with great, great, great relief. This relief is like, like Bhante would say, uh, like letting go of a very heavy burden that you've been carrying for a long time. And you've seen the whole of the path all the way to the end and what arises is three kinds of contacts there is the voidness contact there is there was nobody there it was all gone there's the signless contact where there was no sign in the mind anymore there was no object in the mind that was all there was nothing there was nothing at all to be aware of and there was the undirected contact. The mind was not inclined towards anything at all, not even awareness itself. There was completely open. And when the, when the mind comes out of that state, which is Nibbana, and these are the three contacts that we can tell that a mind has touched Nibbana, basically. Voidness, signless, and undirected. This is animita, sunyata, and apanihita. It's not in the sutta, unfortunately. It's in another one. <laughs> and when the mind obviously experiences these three contacts, there's also, I call it the fourth contact, but the contact of bliss, the contact of really uh, joy, really beautiful joy of relief. And this joy will stay for pretty much uh, a, very, a quite long time. The only thing that happens, it doesn't really fade away, it, it just, you just kind of get used to it. <laughs> and. Um, Basically, from there, I think there, there's a lot of things to say about this, but 
from there, the meditation changes quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of faith that arises in the practice because you've experienced for yourself all the way to the end, the whole of the path, and you know the way, and you know what Nibbana is. Now, the thing is that Nibbana is not just becoming an arahant. Nibbana is when there's sabba sankara samato, when there's all the sankaras in the mind have been released. And the first experience of that will usually last for a second or two or just a few seconds. I called it the, the kiss of Nibbana, basically. It's really just like really quick. <laughs> and um, it doesn't mean that you're a fully awakened being. It just means that you've seen the whole of the path. And you actually can lose this. You can forget this. If you're really heedless for the rest of your life, then you can possibly lose this. But if you continue and continue understand and continue practicing the Dhamma and practicing, continue opening up this aperture of release in your mind, then more and more you'll be very 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 confident about it you'll know how to get there you'll know how it works and you'll just be able to go back there whenever you want and this is the fruit this is pala so there is magga and there is pala and pala is it's unshakable you can't lose it so i invite you to practice until that happens <laughs> and that you're secured in this amazing bliss of release and that's what I wish for all of you on this retreat or on a subsequent retreat or on a subsequent retreat and hopefully uh, I'll see you there <laughs> Very good. So I'll, I'll explain it before. Yes, a yeah, little bit. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so what I've given you tonight is only a road map. You remember the first talk I gave, I talked about the compass, which was wise understanding, Samma Ditti. And the jhanas is the map. So what I gave you tonight is just a road map the map of the Buddha and so you can orient yourself a little better on the path you can know a little better where you are and slowly as the retreat goes on you'll know a bit better what what's going on and we can talk about it and so that now everybody has that knowledge everybody has the map and that is for years to keep Okay, Satike. <laughs> okay, let's share our merits. Punya ni mo dana page to ekting to ekting two thirteen. Dukha patta cha ni dukha. Bhaya patta cha nibhaya Soka patta cha nisoka Hondu sabbe pi panino Idang no punyang sabbe satta numorantu Sabba Sampati Siddhya Aka Satta Cha Bhumatta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyam Tanganumoritwa Chirang Rakhantu Buddha Sasasalam